So I'm going to take you through this talk uh, with the help of a few simple questions. To begin with, what is the aim of the antibiotic administered is what we need to ask ourselves. How do I anticipate the culprit organism in a surgical site infection? How do I select the best drug once the bug is identified? And finally, how do I overcome the nuisance of biofilm? Let's begin with the first question. And for that, we need to understand the hierarchy of antimicrobial usage. So if you're using it for elective surgery for a close fracture, you're using prophylactic antibiotics before the microbes enter the body. In an injury, open fracture, you're using prophylactic antibiotics. Here the microbes have already entered the sterile body compartment, you're expecting an infection and hence you give early antibiotics to prevent it. Empiric antibiotics are given in the case of an infected wound, a symptomatic patient when you may have sent cultures or you don't know what the bug is. Once the culture report is available, you're targeting the bug and this is targeted antibiotic usage against a known pathogen. And finally, when you choose to retain an implant in spite of infection, then you're using suppressive antibiotics against a known pathogen. What is the importance of understanding this? There's a rationale. When you're using empiric antibiotics or preemptive antibiotics for organisms which are unknown, you will always try to give a broader cover. However, that spectrum has to narrow down and target when you're using it for a prophylactic purpose or for targeted or suppressive purpose. Next question, how do I anticipate the culprit organism? Let's start by understanding the colonizing flora of the skin which gives us an indication of what we should think of in closed injuries or surgical prophylaxis, clean surgeries. Strep, staph, coagulase, negative staph are really the most important skin colonizers and these are the ones that need to be routinely targeted. Environmental and soil pathogens are a completely different ball boil game. And you have a host of these that need to be considered when you're dealing with a patient who's had an injury at a site like this. What about nosocomial pathogens? In orthopedic implant infections, you'd actually divide them into early infections, which are caused generally by the more virulent pathogens, which occur within hours, days, or a few weeks of your surgery. These are most importantly staph, whether it's MSSA or MRSA, streptococcus, clostridial species, and the gram-negative organisms, which are often multi-drug resistant. Delayed infections usually occur due to less virulent pathogens and these occur several weeks, months or years after surgery. The most important of these less virulent or indolent pathogens is a coagulase negative staph, propionibacterium, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, even fungi which can present months later. Partially treated gram positive or gram negative virulent pathogens can present months later if you have treated them empirically with antibiotics when you suspected an infection earlier. So these are the summary of the anticipated bugs, which I'll quickly take you through it, that in close, it's sort of divided on the basis of closed injuries, the exposure to hospitalization and antibiotics, which help you decide what the organisms are, and we'll come back to this in a little while. Next question, how do I select the best drug once the bug is identified? Let's start with the gram-positive organisms for which Staph aureus is really the most important. Staph aureus, we know, is a killer organism. It has a very strong affinity for host proteins. It causes severe sepsis, dramatic <laughs> metastasis to various sites, and it's the most common organism isolated in bone and joint infection. So rapidly limb and life threatening. Coagulase negative Staph, on the other hand, is an indolent pathogen, most probably associated with uh, foreign body infections. And although it can cause loss of limb and life, it happens slowly. It's a slow killer. Methicillin susceptible versus methicillin resistant staph aureus. When you're looking at a report, oxacillin is the surrogate for methicillin. If it's susceptible, if cefazolin or the first generation cephalosporins are susceptible, you're dealing with a methicillin susceptible staph aureus. Another thing to look for on, a, on this uh, report is the cefoxetin screen. This is very important and a good lab will always give you this result because this is a screen that actually induces the methicillin resistance gene. So if this screen is positive, you can say with confirmation that this is a methicillin resistant staph aureus and has to be treated accordingly. What are the ideal antibiotics? We know that for the methicillin sensitive agents, it's cloxacillin, flucloxacillin or first or second generation cephalosporins, here are some of the others. For the methicillin resistant organisms, whether it's staph aureus or cons, 
vancomycin, tycoplanin, linezolid, which should be avoided initially because it's bacteriostatic, daptomycin, and now a new fifth generation cephalosporin called Zinforo. Important to remember that for methicillin sensitive organisms, vancomycin, tycoplanin, linezolid are inferior to cloxacillin or the first or second generation cephalosporins. So please don't continue to use these antibiotics when you have isolated sensitive organisms. Let's look at the gram-negative organisms simplified. All three of these are gram-negative organisms with different sensitivity patterns. Let's take, you start with the third generation cephalosporin, like ceftriaxone, which is a prototype. If this is susceptible, you're dealing with a susceptible organism. If your BLBLIs, like piperacillin tazobactam, or cephaparazone salbactam, magnex, those are susceptible, whereas your third generation cephalosporin is resistant, then you're dealing with an ESBL or an extended spectrum pathogen. And finally, if meropenem is also resistant, you're dealing with a carbapenem resistant pathogen. Simply, if you've got a susceptible organism, you're good to go with a third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or ciprofloxacin if it's sensitive. If you have ESBL pathogens, go for the BLBLIs like your Zosin, Tazac, Magnex, Ciplox if sensitive or a carbapenem if you're expecting a high inoculum infection, incomplete source control, very sick patient. Finally, if you've got a carbapenem resistant organism, you need expert opinion. Summarizing bugs and drugs and surgical site infection, if I have a closed injury, antibiotic naive, these are my organisms, I'm good to go with the cloxacillin or a first or second generation cephalosporin. If it's the same injury but multiple procedures, antibiotics, Think of the nosocomial pathogens as well as MRSA candida and add that cover accordingly. Open contaminated wounds, think of poly polymicrobial, anaerobes, moles, NTM, and accordingly you'd need to add metronidazole if you're suspecting anaerobes. Open contaminated wounds, multiple procedures, multiple antibiotic exposure, you think of both the soil organisms plus your nosocomial multidrug resistant organisms. Finally, how do I overcome the nuisance of biofilm? Unfortunately, most of the organisms that cause implant-associated infections in orthopedics all form very effective biofilms, and we know that they have strength in numbers. The drugs that act against biofilm are few, but we need to remember that they are different for gram-positive organisms. Important to note that rifampicin and phosphomycin must be used in combination. And for the gram-negative pathogens, ciprofloxacin is really the only go-to choice, phosphomycin in combination. The take-home messages from here are that understand the choice depends upon whether you're using it for prophylactic, preemptive, empiric targeted or suppressive treatment. Anticipate the bug based on the type of wound, previous surgeries and antibiotic exposure. Once the bug is identified, narrow down on the best option. And finally, biofilm agents, if implants must be retained, should be used. Thank you.